Very well. Uh, let's continue with the lectures today. Uh, my name is, uh, let's see, Bon matin, je m'appelle Xavier. Je parle en français un peu, mais uh, that's it for today. <laughs> I get myself in trouble when I'm in French speaking places because I know enough to, to cause trouble, but not enough to keep up. Uh, so I'm here to present on uh, hydrogen and absorption and its applications pr primarily from the observational side, although today I'll be working the nitty gritty of even some of the astrophysics. Uh, I thought it'd be useful to, since I don't know hardly any of you, to introduce myself just with a few slides. I come from UC Santa Cruz, California, and I'm a part of a, a program of studies that we call IMPS. That's the, our lovely little slogan there. And I tend to use large telescopes to study uh, the distant universe in gas, as I'll, I'll emphasize in a moment. Uh, my training's largely in physics. Um, I know some astronomy. I picked it up along the way, kind of assimilated it uh, between here and there, Carnegie and, and some in Santa Cruz. Uh, I grew up in New England in the United States and uh, got my French training there. And my interests include, amongst other things, skiing. That's probably why I'm here. But um, uh, I have a family of three kids and a wife who I miss dearly already, but happy to see you folks uh, instead. My research uh, focuses on gas in and around galaxies, sometimes right inside galaxies. We call that the interstellar medium. My PhD thesis was on damp Lyman alpha systems. You'll understand what that means by the end of the week. Um, I also work on gas around galaxies. We've heard a little bit this morning. We call that the circumgalactic medium, CGM. used to be known as halo gas, but I guess that wasn't catchy enough. So we have an acronym now, CGM. Won't say too much about that this week, but a little bit here and there. And then uh, the intergalactic medium, the IGM, another acronym. Uh, that's the gas in between galaxies. You should be thinking cosmological scales. Uh, uh, yeah, the biggest scales in the universe, and that's where we really uh, touch on uh, cosmology. But some of the techniques I'll describe to you, uh, the data also apply to uh, varying fun fundamental constants, um, some real nitty-gritty astrophysics, plenty of work on chemical abundances, which this is not the focus of, so on and so forth. Uh, observationally, I, I am mainly a spectroscopist and usually a high dispersion spectro spectroscopist, so you will see quite a bit of spectroscopy uh, from me as we go, as we discuss uh, absorption line gas. Um, but I've been dabbling most recently and more recently in, in airband imaging, some with Sebastiano. You saw some of his work earlier today. Uh, I'm excited about the new IFUs that have come online or are coming online. Uh, that'll open up as well uh, the study of this gas. Uh, on large scales and in the distant universe. And I've always kept a close eye on uh, cosmolog cosmological simulations. They really do guide uh, a lot of the research that I've done, um, partly because uh, when you do analysis and absorption, you're not generally not able to study the gas and emission at the same time. And so you're fumbling about with uh, you know, very detailed information, but connecting that to the big picture can be challenging. And it's useful to, uh, to refer to cosmological simulations, both to give you guidance on the intuit, intuition side, but also to test uh, those theories that come out of, of the big computers. So uh, my approach to lectures, maybe, you know, I think it looks like probably each of the lecturers here have a different style and a different approach. You'll have to adjust as we switch from person to person. Um, I'm here to give you an introduction to hydrogen absorption. Uh, I'm going to talk about the full Lyman series uh, and also the continuum opacity, uh, although Lyman off is the main focus. And uh, I'm going to provide you with tools so that you can do your own research when you leave the school. I, I'm taking this more as a school than a workshop, of course. And I'm here to also interact with it throughout the week. So please ask me questions over breakfast, or lunch, whatever, dinner. Catch me on the ski slopes uh, if you can. Uh, and if, I've, I've made uh, materials kind of in three forms. I've got traditional lecture notes, which I had expected to be using on a chalkboard. I have a chalkboard now, but my handwriting is not sufficient for that chalkboard to be useful, so I'm going to present them on the screen uh, a little bit as we go. So hopefully that works okay. I've got slides, which you're seeing now, um, and I've also built up a number of IPython notebooks. How many people are somewhat savvy with Python? Yeah, more than half of you, good. Um, it's possible those will be the most useful thing that comes out of my lectures. You'll have uh, these you can work with. They're examples uh, that you can then modify to your heart's delight and some code that you can take advantage of. So all that uh, is available to you. Um, it will make my, my presentation a bit choppy. I'm going to jump from slides to 
lecture notes to notebooks, but bear with me. Uh, if you want immediate access, or just access anytime, email me, and I will give you access, read access to the Dropbox. And uh, you'll, if you actually monitor my progress, you'll see some of the lectures are still to come, but um, you'll have access to uh, all the materials uh, to your heart's content. Uh, some of the material, a lot of the material really is the first time I'm presenting, at least in kind of a lecture, more of a traditional lecture form, so bear with me. I, I don't necessarily have the timing down, and there's probably typos in the lecture notes, and I'll correct them as best I can. By all means, feel free to point them out. And I'm encouraging you to ask questions as I go, as opposed to the end. Uh, I'll pause and see if you have anything that you want to contribute or ask. So let me stop there. Any questions so far? <laughs> it's a, big, a bit of a big audience, I know, for interaction, although uh, you seem like a lively bunch, so don't. Don't be shy. OK. Um, it, I think they more or less will break down, the lecture will more or less break down like this. I'm going to do some nitty gritty astrophysics for the first one, one and a half lectures, uh, finishing up with some real basics on spectroscopy so that when I say the word resolution, you all are on the same page as I am. And when I say a continuum of a quasar, you understand what that means. Uh, and you'll get some intuition to actually the redshift of absorption, which is not so obvious things like that. Uh, roughly two lectures on characterizing lamina alpha force. It's a bit of the traditional approach. Um, it's hard to find this material in a textbook, which is why I've labored a bit to put them into some notes. Uh, it'll be useful, hopefully, too. And then I will go into the optically thick gas in the universe. Lime, we call them Lyman limit systems and damp Lyman off systems. It's kind of our lingo. You'll appreciate what those mean. Uh, touching on the science that we uh, perform with those with that gas, how it's relevant to, the cosmo to our cosmology. And then the last two lectures, we'll come back to the IGM, uh, the intergalactic medium, uh, focusing on modern uh, studies and, and future applications. That's the basic plan. Great. So to get us warmed up, um, some slides, kind of a mix of history in the present day. Uh, here is a spectrum. Here's your first one, for me at least. Uh, optical spectrum taken with a Nichelle spectrometer, so high dispersion on the Keck telescope. And uh, most of the analysis, most of the discussion that I will have throughout the week is going to be on the left-hand side of the, of the spectrum here, the so-called Lyman alpha forest. And those, are, those features there, which we'll get into in nitty-gritty, are the absorption lines uh, that allow us to uh, analyze this intergalactic medium and, and uh, derive physical properties for the gas throughout our universe. Now this field of study, that's right, I don't have transitions. This field of study really began with the discovery of quasars. So it's that now, 40, 50, 4, 53 years ago uh, by Martin Schmidt. And it was really amazing, only quite shortly after the discovery, uh, and I highlight some work by these two uh, infamous astronomers, Jeffrey Burbage on the right, Margaret Burbage's wife on the left. They took uh, some spectra of these, immediately, almost immediately took spectra of these distant quasars. With the Lick 3 meter, pretty heroic, uh, a spectrometer at the prime focus camera. Um, and here it is, in its glory. Uh, absorption line spectroscopy, circa 1965. Here at the center is the light from that distant source, the quasar. Uh, these features on the side are their calibration spectra. It would allow them to turn that data into calibrated data so they could determine the wavelengths. Pretty amazing. Uh, here uh, is the emission, rather faint looking, from the uh, Lyman alpha emission from the quasar itself. And they recognized, even in what looks like a, a pretty smudgy spectrum, that there were uh, discrete absorption features in that data that they could associate it with gas lying foreground to that distant quasar. And so already in the early days, they had hints or even recognition here, maybe more cleanly, a metal line transition from carbon, that there was uh, absorption gas in between us and that quasar, or associated with that quasar, that was debated, uh, within the data itself. Rather quickly as well, uh, people, Gunn, in particular Gunn and Peterson, this is not Peterson, that's uh, of a call, I'll show you in a moment, recognized that the fact that there, were, there was, actually, not so much the absorption, but the lack of absorption, the fact that there was flux, not a lot necessarily, but flux to the blueward of that uh, Lyman alpha emission peak of the quasar uh, indicated that the universe had to be highly ionized. And so maybe focus on this sentence here. It is observed that the continuum of the source continues to the blue of Lyman alpha. 
so that there was uh, emitted flux, short word of Lyman alpha of the source. And uh, Gunn and Peterson worked out that for that to be the case, and we'll work through this calculation ourselves, uh, it must be true that it must be the case that the uh, universe was highly ionized to about one part in a million, maybe a few parts in a million, in order for the, the light to be transmissive through uh, our cosmological space, intergalactic medium. Pretty insightful. Uh, but Colin Salpeter pointed out that uh, if the neutral hydrogen gas was clumped into, well, they thought at the time, clusters of galaxies, it's not the modern picture, of course, uh, then this, instead of the continuum opacity the overall, that Gunn and Peterson were thinking about, that the universe would have some mean density and absorb all the light, uh, these guys, gentlemen, recognized that, uh, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> that the absorption, if it were clumpy, then would give you a discrete series of absorption lines, right, which is indeed what we observe now uh, in the spectrometers. It's worth mentioning there were other even earlier searches for intergalactic gas with the 21 centimeter line, Mark mentioned this, so George Field made an effort to uh, s determine if there was, to search for really, uh, extragalactic 21 centimeter absorption using bright distant radio sources uh, and the hyperfine splitting of the hydrogen atom. He failed and so just put an upper limit on the amount of gas out in the uh, distant universe. And there was even searches for uh, intergalactic molecular hydrogen early on, also failed. Uh, so other probes of the universe, but it's been Lyman Alpha really that's been our uh, primary way of, of probing uh, the high, neutral hydrogen throughout our universe. I jumped forward about 20 years, not quite, maybe 15, uh, and highlight research by Wal Sargent and Alex Boxenberg. These, with the uh, buildup of high quality detectors on five meter, in this case, class telescopes, uh, really the Lyman Alpha force was revealed uh, for the first time at pretty high quality. This is a single quasar spectrum, again, Lyman alpha emission of the quasar. Uh, we'll see a bit more of that as we go. And then discrete, the series of discrete absorption features that this is really what we refer to as the, as the Lyman alpha forest. And it was quite a heroic uh, effort to uh, take, even with a five meter class telescope, and actually this was, I think, a four meter class telescope, to get quality specs like this. Took many, many, many hours of integration, even nights of integration, um, to reveal this spectrum. As I said, we will talk about optically thick gas. This is David Teitler, uh, who led some of the pioneering work on that material. I'm in limit absorption. This is the continuum opacity from a hydrogen. So we'll, I will also describe that in detail. Uh, and it's this optically thick gas which attenuates the radiation field uh, of our universe. So the ionizing photons emitted by quasars, distant galaxies, and the like. Another pioneer of the field, Art Wolf, uh, my PhD advisor, uh, who really uh, invented, if you will, the damp Lyman alpha, the concept of damp Lyman alpha systems, and uh, the survey of them for uh, probing the neutral gas, in particular in galaxies throughout our universe. Here, I focus on uh, one of the early spectra of what we call a damp Lyman alpha system, and maybe even by the end of the day, you'll understand the astrophysics behind uh, its absorption. With uh, the advent of 10 meter class telescopes and large shell spectrometers, and by large, you should picture mm, something about this size here. So in a shell, one instrument that takes kind of the entire platform of the Naismith on a 10 meter telescope. The future generations, some of the designs are the size of a tennis court. So a spectrometer the entire size of this room. Uh, heroic efforts really to build just those instruments, but then now we can use them. Uh, I showed you uh, this spectrum from the five meter class telescopes by, by Sargent and his collaborators. Here I show you another one. Again, the Lyman alpha emission uh, from a distant quasar, series of absorption features. Uh, we call this Lyman alpha forest. And uh, what with the, uh, the 10 meter class telescopes really transformed our view uh, and, and, and gives us really the modern view of the Lyman alpha forest. Uh, and it's a, a little exercise I enjoy doing even with experts. Uh, with a crowd of experts, and that is, uh, this is, this is a snippet of this quasar spectrum, all right, taken with a 10 meter class telescope and a shell spectrometer, and the, the bet on the table is if you want to play the game, you, you will put up 20, what are we in, Swiss francs, um, 
and I will put up 26 francs, and you will tell me where in the spectrum is this slice of data. And there are people in the room that have played this before, and they're allowed to play again. That's how hard this game is. <laughs> How precise do you have to be to within, let's see, those are units of what, 100 angstroms to, yeah, you, I'll, I'll give you a clue, this is of the order probably of 100 angstroms, so you have to be, you have to pick the tick mark. Are the data in the Dropbox? Is the data in the Dropbox? Mm. <laughs> I can't recall if I, I have put in data in the Dropbox, I don't remember if I put the spectrum in, but I'd be happy to. If, any, any requests you have, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put in there. Right, so um, this is what I mean by transforming the field. I mean, this was our view of the Lyme alpha force in the class in the, of, you know, five meter telescopes. This now became our view with 10 meter telescopes. And oh yeah, don't have the transitions. There you go. Anybody have it? I'll tell you, I, every time I go through these slides, I can't remember <laughs> where the feature is. So this, you know, Okay, there was absorption here, no doubt about it, right? But it was clear that at that spectral resolution, something alpha size, we weren't getting all the information uh, out of that lineman alpha forest. All right, 20 euros, 20, 20 Swiss francs. See if you can find the tick mark in your head. Give you a moment. Before I do that, let's just emphasize, this, this now is how you should be visualizing line force. A thicket of absorption features, right? Uh, widths, as we'll see, of order 30 kilometers per second. And uh, dynamic range in uh, the optical depth of these features. Quantities I'll define as we go. Left side of the previous. So you're proposing somewhere down here? I think the clue you should have gotten in your head is look at the, the signal noise improved. And usually signal noise is easier to get to the right. The observers in the crowd will appreciate. So I, I, that's about the only clue I have in my head. It's a, it's a different scale. Okay, so the latency, I didn't Right? It looks almost nothing the same. And then lastly, if you want to play one more time. All right. Maybe that one makes a little more sense. Anyways, um, that became now, observationally, uh, our, really our ultimate view of the Lima Forest. At this, at this stage, we now, you know, with a 10-meter class telescope and a large shell, we do have the spectral resolution to extract essentially all the information that's there. You can always improve on signal noise, okay, reduce the statistical errors, if you will. But in terms of the view, in much like now with Planck and WMAP, we've resolved out the CMB, with uh, an initial spectrometer and a 10-meter telescope, we've resolved out uh, the features of the Lyme alpha forest. And that's the first slide. So this is that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just say one slide, or give one uh, reminder that a lot of the techniques that we have used in characterizing the absorption from the intergalactic medium stem from work that was done previously on the interstellar medium in the true ultraviolet, uh, the transitions are in the ultraviolet and the far ultraviolet, but uh, the true ultraviolet, of course, means Hubble Space Telescope or some other uh, pr you know, predecessors to that as well. Um, and I highlight uh, Lyman Spitzer here, who really laid out a lot of the fundamentals of absorption line analysis and wrote a nice textbook as well. Um, so one of these here is um, gas in the Locally, our universe, sorry, our galaxy. <laughs> sorry. And one of these is absorption from gas in the distant universe, and I also can't tell the difference. Um, probably if I really thought about it, because I know the instruments. But to Sir Earth order, uh, the, the astrophysics is more or less the same, of course, and the data have now even become more or less the same, whether or not we're doing the experiment in our own Milky Way or the experiment uh, at the edge of the universe. So one of those is here and one of those far away and I don't even know. Um, as I head towards the end of the week, I will uh, introduce or stress the, the current paradigm for the intergalactic medium. It's an undulating density field. That's how you should view it. Uh, this is something that came out of numerical simulations uh, quite nicely, it still does. So it's really a paradigm of our modern cosmology. Uh, here in the central, central panel is fluctuating densities uh, on uh, large scales, maybe tens of microparsec scales here. And those 
fluctuating densities and complex velocity field associated with expansion in the universe and peculiar velocities associated with collapse, gravitational collapse, give rise to uh, an undulating flux field, which is what we observe in the data. All right, so that's our modern paradigm of the intergalactic medium, fluctuating density field set up by cosmology, including uh, motions of expansion as well as peculiar motions of gravitational collapse, and together that combines to give a, a flux uh, field that we can measure uh, in the spectroscopy. So uh, today the IGM is used as a cosmological tool, I'll probably say a few, a few slides at least towards the end, on uh, one of the new experiments which is to use uh, the clustering or the uh, correlations in the flux field, in the density field as we estimate from the intergalactic medium on large scales that can give you a precise, really reasonably precise estimate of baryonic acoustic oscillations. This is driving the next, some of the next experiments uh, on the IGM. Um, another area of research, uh, one that I'm involved in, is to use background galaxies instead of quasars uh, to map out, again, the density field in the foreground <clears throat> and study the, the tomography of density fields on with roughly megaparsec or a few megaparsec resolutions. So using uh, the absorption associated with that we believe in this paradigm uh, correlates with the density field to uh, map out the density field uh, in the early universe. I think that's all I had yep, for a quick introduction. Any questions so far? Did I have an overview? Nothing? Great. Well then fasten your seatbelt because here we go into some nitty gritty of uh, astrophysics and I may have to sit to do this as I was expecting to do a um, chalkboard presentation, but that's a nice chalkboard, but my handwriting so, is poor enough that I need a real big chalkboard <laughs> or you will suffer. Um, so again, these, these lecture notes will be available online. I'm not gonna go through every word or equation. That's, wasn't, wasn't expecting that chalkboard either, but give you some of the highlights. Um, I, I'll begin with the description of um, <clears throat> the energy levels of uh, hydrogen Lyman series. Mark went through a few of these as well, but uh, let me give you some of the quantum mechanics, some of the highlights, and then I'm going to go into the line profile, which sets the cross-section for absorption, which is absolutely essential to any of the analysis that we do. So um, <clears throat> Mark uh, introduced kind of the classic, if you will, classical energy levels of hydrogen, which follow quite directly from a simple Hamiltonian, uh, kinetic energy and potential energy of the uh, proton-electron system. And uh, you derive from that simple Hamiltonian energies of that form, okay, with the 1 over n squared uh, dependence. You may or may not recall, uh, the alpha here is the fine structure constant, e squared over h bar c, or roughly uh, numerical value 1 over 137, and mu is just the reduced mass, which for uh, hydrogenic ions is, is roughly the mass of the electron. Fine. Uh, so from those energy levels, we calculate uh, wavelengths for the transitions. And might as well start to write those down. Again, 1s to 2p, <coughs> our Lyman alpha transition. Uh, the ground state with those energies is 13.6 electron volts below zero. And the first excited state is, is 3.4 electron volts. So the difference uh, in those energies gives us a rest wavelength of order uh, 1,215 angstroms. Uh, when we do that calculation, here are the first few lines of the Lyman series, we get a number of something like this, 1215.68 angstroms. <clears throat> but when we go to the laboratory uh, and actually measure uh, the energy or the wavelength of that transition, it's slightly off, 12.67. Uh, now you might say, well, who cares about a couple hundredths of an angstrom? Um, turns out a couple hundredths of an angstrom is a few kilometers per second, about three, and that's a few, even a few pixels on a detector within a shell spectrometer. So easily to measure. Uh, clearly something's uh, amiss or not complete in our description of the energy levels from just the uh, simple Hamiltonian. And you probably, you may recall, so let me go into a little bit of uh, the, uh, the quantum mechanics here. 
spin orbit coupling. The cartoon you should have in your head is an electron with its own spin. Put it, put it in the rest frame and you have a proton with an angular momentum uh, moving about it. The motions of the uh, proton around the um, electron gives you a current, which is just V cross E. Uh, v we can express in terms of the angular momentum, as Mark emphasized, that's, as, you know, as you know, that's quantized. And the electric field is just the derivative of our electrostatic potential. Okay. And then the energy of that interaction is just the dipole uh, dotted in with the magnetic field, where the, we have the dipole from the spin of the electron. And that's the basics of spin or coupling. A proper Hamiltonian is here. So rewriting e dot, or mu dot e uh, in terms of a Hamiltonian is just this. We have now explicitly uh, the dot product between uh, the spin of the electron and the angular momentum of the proton moving around it, the other terms as well. And uh, in quantum mechanics, it's then our task to find the energies of this perturbation. Um, we can use, we can look to the uh, quantum, unperturbed quantum states of the simple Hamiltonian, which you'll recall we quantize in terms of the orbital level, the angular momentum, uh, its value, and the spin of the electron. Um, but you may also recall from an undergraduate quantum mechanics class that we can rewrite this Hamiltonian in terms of the total angular momentum, J, which is the sum of the angular momentum and the spin. With that consideration, our Hamiltonian becomes, can we rewrite, well, the, the L dot S, the spin orbit coupling term in our Hamiltonian can be rewritten now as the uh, difference between the magnitudes of the angular momentum, the spin, and the magnitude, the total magnitude of the total angular momentum as such. And in that, with that uh, description of the Hamiltonian, we can get, rather derive rather trivially now, uh, energies for uh, this perturbation, which are the form J times J plus one for the from the total angular momentum uh, minus the, uh, the spin and the uh, angular momentum of the proton terms. Okay, so we've seen that before, um, but it's nice to apply it to hydrogen now. So explicitly, and um, don't try and write this down, <laughs> it's in the lecture notes, um, there's our Hamiltonian for hydrogen, or the atomic number of one, you do uh, the calculation for the 1s to the 2p level, uh, knowing the, the uh, radial eigen states for the 1s and the 2p levels. Messy, messy uh, algebra ensues. But let's skip to kind of the bottom line, which is this. And we wind up with the perturbation to the energies that uh, is proportional to the original energies, that's what En is here, times the fine structure squared, uh, and then Here's our, again, our spin orbit coupling terms, the J, J plus ones and the L, L plus ones. We see that uh, the perturbations of order alpha squared, which means that, sorry, the perturbations actually of order alpha to the fourth because En, as uh, you saw earlier in the equation, is of order alpha squared. So we have a fourth order uh, term of, of in alpha, and there's explicit dependence, dependencies now on the total angular momentum and the angular momentum and the spin of uh, the system. So applying that to hydrogen, which is what we're really after, uh, and just in terms of spin orbit coupling, we have a splitting now of the 2p level so that Lyman alpha is actually a doublet. There are transitions, permitted transitions from both 1s to 2p at the 1 half with j of 1 half and 1s to 2p at j of 3 halves. And we estimate a, uh, a splitting of the order of kilometer per second between uh, that pair of transitions. Not too important kilometer per second to even uh, our absorption line studies, um, but potentially important to radiative transfer studies, although probably not generally. This is, however, incomplete. Uh, oh, yeah, a nice aside. 
Um, this dependence, the splitting of the 2p level, this ast astrophysically you see uh, similar uh, splittings in uh, metal transitions, carbon, magnesium, and silicon, to name a few. Uh, and we can actually invert the problem, and people, myself included, have worked on this, and measure uh, what the actual, you know, measure in the lab what those splittings are. Calculate them if you can. And then make that same measurement in the distant universe uh, of the splittings between these transitions to place constraints on the fine structure constant, alpha, given that the splitting is proportional to alpha squared, leaving alpha to the fourth. So that's an aside, but some of the work that we do uh, using the same astrophysics. Now, uh, you've probably seen the spin orbit coupling uh, description before. Uh, you may not fully appreciate, or may not, or may have forgotten, that uh, this term, which goes like alpha the fourth, uh, is not the only correction to the uh, standard Hamiltonian that is proportional to alpha the fourth. In fact, the, the relativistic correction, the first order relativistic correction, also goes like alpha the fourth and is an important part of the story as well. So let me just walk through that. So uh, the first order correction to the, uh, rel to the um, relativistic correction to the Hamiltonian is to expand the kinetic energy, one term in V squared over C squared. Here it is. Uh, that's just the non-relativistic. Here's now the first uh, uh, expansion of the kinetic energy in V squared over C squared, which you can rewrite. Doesn't look obvious, but I worked it. I, I verified this last night. Um, the relativistic perturbation then becomes this, uh, p squared over 2m to the squared, so our, our kind of our original term squared. Fine. There's no uh, explicit spin dependence in that uh, perturbation, uh, which is say it, it commutes with both L and L squared, and the standard, our st standard eigenfunctions um, immediately diagonalize that, perturb that perturbation. So it's relatively straightforward to get the energies. Uh, the, probably the easiest, most insightful way, if you will, to, uh, to derive them are to recognize that this term is equal to uh, the original Hamiltonian minus the, uh, uh, the electrostatic potential uh, squared. And with that substitution, it's again pretty straightforward, although don't dwell on the, on the algebra here, to uh, determine the energies of relativistic corrections. So, uh, this is just the uh, uh, squaring out those terms, uh, working them out uh, from the eigenfunctions, and it reduces kind of magically, really, to just two terms. Uh, again, in alpha to the fourth, I'll explicitly alpha squared here, um, a term that goes like the uh, 1 over n related to just the radial functions, so from the potential term and from our original term, and a term that goes like the angular momentum or the inverse of the angular momentum uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the system. So, um, we can combine that with the spin orbit term, and really, this one does look magical to me. The j, j plus minus 1, minus l, l plus minus 1, minus s plus 1, actually reduces uh, entirely to just this expression. And perhaps that's what you should walk away with, I think, more than anything else from uh, these first few pages of notes, is uh, the corrections to alpha to the fourth uh, on the original uh, Hamiltonian is just this. Uh, which depends only on the uh, orbital level and uh, the total angular momentum of the system. So, no explicit L dependence, no S dependence, and if you know, if you recall your Hund's rules, uh, you'll recall uh, that higher J implies higher energy, which is indeed which we've derived uh, from this pair of corrections. So here, somewhat in its glory, is uh, the corrections to the 1s and the 2p states. Again, still a splitting uh, of the 2p states between the 2p 1 half and the 2p 3 halves. And uh, now even a small correction to the ground state uh, from our uh, relativistic correction. So does that explain the difference between uh, our Rutherford approximation for the, for the wavelengths and our observed uh, wavelengths? The answer is yes, of course. Um, the wavelength shift delta lambda on lambda is proportional to delta E on E. We've just calculated the delta E's. Um, if you are measuring just one characteristic energy for lambda and alpha, uh, now we need to take into account this uh, splitting of the 2p state and the relative weights of the two. J of, half, J of 3 halves, uh, of course, has a uh, 
2j plus 1 um, degeneracy, or yeah, degeneracy associated with it. So we have uh, four available states for the three halves, two available states for the one halves. So the energy that we derive is just a uh, weighted by the degeneracy energy shift uh, for the 2p levels from the 1s. That's all I've done here. And we measure that the shift in wavelengths for Lyman alpha from uh, the Rutherford expression is just a 0.014 angstroms as, as measured in the uh, laboratory. Let me pause there. Any questions on that? I know it's a bit heavy, but uh, I think it's nice to understand and appreciate uh, the origin of the Lyman alpha line in its, in its glory. Um, of course, you could even do higher perturbation corrections, but those become nearly unmeasurable. Uh, for completeness and without derivation, let me introduce or write down uh, the spontaneous emission coefficient. So when you are, uh, for a, an electron up in the 2p level, um, uh, the, uh, excite, the spontaneous emission coefficient is that, 6.26 times 10 to the 8, which means that its uh, lifetime for spontaneous emission is the inverse of that roughly 10 to the minus 8 seconds. Uh, so a, uh, an electron in the 2p state you know, is there for less than a millionth of a second before it will spontaneously decay to the, to the 1s. That quantity will also be important. OK, um, let's jump in. That was heavy, I know. Um, let's jump in the notebook just for a moment. One of the tools uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention, a package that we call line tools, something I've developed with Neil Crichton and Nicholas Tejos, uh, gives you access to the atomic data for the hydrogen lines. Um, lineless is just a class within um, this package. And as I say, it gives you access to the full uh, set of uh, uh, physical data that you may be, well, that you may need in order to do calculations of the Lyman series. So uh, here there's an example, uh, just the, um, Oscillar, the oscillator strengths, which I'll introduce in a moment, the uh, spontaneous coefficients, and the gamma values, which I'll also introduce in a moment. Here are the values for Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, gamma, blah, 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 um, in case you need access to them. Uh, it's our intent to keep, well, not, not only do we include the hydrogen lines, but many, 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 many far UV transitions, probably a few thousand. Uh, if, you're, if you need that kind of atomic data, um, you can find it here within this line tools package. And again, you'll have access to this uh, notebook to um, to see how to, to call that and manipulate that as you wish. Okay, line profile. Let me do it this way. So, uh, next cartoon, opacity. Let me define that. Although most of the discussion will be in terms of optical depth, not opacity, nevertheless. You should visualize some box, if you will, with gas within it. And we'll characterize that gas by a number density, J. And we will now uh, derive the cross section of that gas to some energy level K, uh, which has an explicit frequency dependence. And so the opacity, you should be thinking of radiation travel to the box. The opacity is the average absorption uh, per path length traveled through the box. So it's got units of one over length here. Number density is straightforward. The cross section is, is now what we'll uh, delve into. So uh, let me define a line profile, phi, which captures the frequency dependence of the absorption of the cross section. And we will uh, hide in sigma jk all the quantum mechanics and physical constants that come along with the normalization of that cross section. All right. So, so. Uh, phi nu plus the probability that an atom will absorb a photon in the uh, frequency interval nu plus uh, nu company plus d nu. You may 
positive. positive. And, and I guess, guess that the line profile should be a delta function. That is, that is uh, from 1s to 2p, the only, the only uh, non-zero probability of transition is right at the line center. Okay. Okay. Simple delta function. It's not an easy guess. guess. In that case, In that case our, our line, line profile, profile will just reduce to the delta, delta function. function. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, that's that's case. not the case. Um, um, but but it's, not, it's not, not a bad starting point, as a guess, as a guess. As a guess. Uh, it's, uh, not case, it's not the case uh, for, uh, number for a number of reasons, first of which is which is scans again and again. As I just emphasized, the half-life of the 2 p state, state goes like goes one over that over that expansion coefficient. coefficient. Um, um, so we have, so we have a finite, finite lifetime associated with the uh, with that energy, with energy level, level from, from from these quantitatively from, from, from the concept of quantum mechanics, mechanics and finite, and finite energy energy uh, uh, finite lifetime lifetime the associated associated with energy energy from the uncertainty principle with the value of energy then the uncertainty would be of order, order uh, uh, h part of t. t. And so the way so I the way I visualize it, right? I have the energy levels. Energy levels. We'll back to I'm alpha, 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 So, so uh, I, uh, I derive, I derive, I think Mark actually mentioned um, the, the description, description of that, of that fuzziness, fuzziness, if you will. If you will. Uh, the, width, uh, the width, which we'll, which we'll call W-E, it's, it's Lorentzian. 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 Skipping down to quick, down to quick. Five, five. It looks like it's something like, like something one over X squared, squared plus constant. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, derived from, from, from uh, considering the two, two energies, energies, the two energy levels, uh, transition between two energy levels. Which is not complete. Uh, this, gamma uh, this gamma value, value here, here, our expression, expression is, is the sum of all the a values, values um, <coughs> uh, below, below uh, that uh, level. level. So from so 1s, one one gamma would be gamma zero, 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 zero. From the 2p state, state uh, there's uh, only uh, one, one energy level energy below it, so gamma is just the a value from 2 to 1. If you were actually talking about absorption from higher states, then gamma is the sum of all the a values from uh, the uh, higher state down to the ground state. But for lime and alpha, 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 gamma, we're just going to worry about the 2p to 1. one. S state, uh, uh, this then becomes our, our, our line, line profile, profile the Lorentzian. Mm, let's go back to the notebook, it's better than the notes. notes. Delta function, here we are. We are. Uh, uh, our expression for Lorentzian. For lime and alpha, as I said, the gamma uh, of J, the 1s state is 0, there's no transitions out of the 1s state. For gamma k to 2p, uh, it's just the a value. There's the energy. And let's jump to the plot. So there is uh, the uh, line profile normalized for the uh, Lorentzian. Looks a lot like a delta function. <laughs> so our intuition wasn't so bad. But there is a finite width. Uh, although not, it's actually more narrow than even here. I'm going to zoom in. Uh, now we're looking at roughly one part in a million uh, in the energy. Um, that's still not resolving uh, the, uh, the Lorentzian. Uh, and we can estimate that the width here, and I'll derive that in a moment, as you can see, you'll see in the notes, uh, is of the order of a few part 10 to the minus 7 EV. Okay, so our guess of a delta function isn't so bad, but quantum mechanics does spread it out to a few parts in 10 to the 7. Uh, okay, and we can now express our line profile, phi of nu, as this Lorentzian. Fine. Um, the other aspect of Lorentzian, uh, which we, I wish to emphasize, are the damping wings, which motivate the so-called damp lime and alpha systems. So uh, now plotting up that line profile, which again is just a Lorentzian, but focusing on the damping wings. And I'm going to shift to velocity space. Um, dv over, or d nu over nu is just proportional to dv over c. So I'm just doing a Jacobian transformation from frequency space to velocity space. No magic there. Uh, and here is 
our Lorentzian profile. Now on a, long, on a log scale, again, the very narrow uh, inner profile width of order 10 to the minus 7 EV. But uh, lo and behold, these wings, okay, out at in velocity space, out at hundreds of thousands of kilometers per second, uh, which are down by about 10 orders of magnitude, okay, in the line profile, which means 10 orders of magnitude in the cross section. It's a lot of orders of magnitude. But if we have enough gas, and that's the key here, then we become sensitive uh, to, well, that then those winds can have an appreciable opacity associated with them as well. And that is what we call it, that's what leads to these so-called damp climate off systems. Uh, I've said all that. Um, let's actually calculate this width. I mentioned it's 10 to minus 7. The, the maximum uh, uh, in, the, in our cross section becomes this. Uh, and I've now introduced the oscillator strength, which uh, hides within it all the quantum mechanical calculations necessary for the normalization. For Lyman alpha, that's of order 0.4. Okay. So physical constants to get the rest of the normalization. And we can ask, where, what is the width at which uh, the, that line profile is about half of the peak? works out to the sum of the gamma factors over 4 pi, which for Lyman alpha, oh, ignore that, <laughs> which for Lyman alpha is just a few times 10 to the minus 5 angstroms, very, very tiny, or about 10 to the minus 2 kilometers per second. So very, very small uh, for Lorentzian. So this is essentially a delta function, uh, at least in, even in our uh, astrophysical terms of what we can measure with a, a spectrometer. Um, out of time for now? Okay, fine. Next time, that's the heaviest as I go, I promise. <laughs> Next time, uh, we will go into the, the Doppler broadening and quickly now look at uh, the effects or actually produce our own absorption lines, uh, idealized absorption lines before uh, carrying that kind, those concepts to the actual spectra themselves. All right, so thank you.